Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Evangelos Gerasopoulos, and in my capacity as the director of the Greek Geo Office, one of the three colleagues of the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory, it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of the two other colleague organizations, UNESCO's World Heritage Center and Geo, to welcome you here today. Before introducing to you the agenda of today's event, I will provide you with some useful administrative information. First of all, you should have indicated your full name and affiliation as you logged in into the Zoom meeting to allow us to get a feeling for the audience when we interact with the panelists. If not, you can still do this at any point. Please post your questions in the QA box as the keynote speakers present. Speakers will do their best to respond in writing or we will pick them up for them to respond during the QA session or the panel discussion at the end. You may also raise your hand if you wish to speak up during the panel discussion. I would also like to inform you that this event is being recorded and we will post it on the website of GEO for future reference. Coming to the agenda, we are delighted to have you with us to participate in the launching of the new GEO community activity the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory, which aspires to bring together experts from diverse scientific communities and stakeholders to address climate change impacts on World Heritage Cities. Today's event opens with welcome notes by the esteemed directors of UNESCO's World Heritage Center and Geo Secretariat. The next section includes four very interesting keynote species from representatives of the Greek state UNFCCC, the Global Covenant of Mayors, and the European Commission Copernicus Program, followed by a 10-minute QA session with, when we can have responses by the speakers to some of your questions. May I remind you that speaker bios are available in the agenda you had the chance to download from GEOS or UNESCO's portal during your registration. Two presentations by the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory colleagues will follow to present the current landscape in World Heritage cities that are threatened by climate change and introduce the new geo community activity. Finally, we shall close the meeting with a moderated panel discussion where all speakers will reply to questions posed by the moderator as well as questions from all of you. At this point, I'm also glad to introduce the two other co-organizers of today's event and colleagues of the observatory, Dr. Yoti Hozagroha, Deputy Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center, who will be presenting later on, and Dr. Sara Venturini, Climate Coordinator at Geo Secretariat, who will moderate the QA session and the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have the Director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center with us today, to deliver her welcoming remarks, Dr. Mechtik Vesla. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Evangelikos. This is really a wonderful to be here. It's a great pleasure to join you all and to welcome you to the launch of the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory. I look very much forward to discussing and reflecting with you on how Earth observation data and tools can support climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as heritage safeguarding, particularly in urban areas. Thank you to our partners at the Geo Secretariat and the Geo Greek Office for making this initiative possible. Climate change is perhaps the greatest threat to humanity's future, and this includes the future of our cultural heritage. A report by IUCN found climate change to be the one number one threat facing natural world heritage properties today. In recent years, we have also seen how climate change affects cultural sites and puts living heritage, all tradition, art, social practices, and traditional knowledge at risk. As climate change fuels displacement, entire ways of life could be lost forever. This crisis is particularly critical in cities where half of the world's population resides. According to OECD, by the end of the century, about 85% of humanity will be based in urban centers. 90% of the world's cities are coastal, making them more vulnerable to climate change impacts such as sea level rise, water surges, flooding, and other climate-related disasters. 
UNESCO has made the fight against climate change central to its mission. Closing the knowledge gap when it comes to the role of cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible for climate change mitigation and adaptation is the goal of a new UNESCO partnership and the IPCC and ECOMOS. An online international expert meeting on cultural heritage and climate change will be organized later this year to strengthen scientific knowledge and collaboration on the role of cultural heritage for climate action. UNESCO's designated sites from World Heritage Properties to Biosphere Reserve, as well as our city networks, including Creative Cities and the World Heritage Cities Program, with jo which Jyoti is running, are unique laboratories for monitoring the impact of climate change on cultural heritage, as well as new approaches to climate change adaptation and mitigation. 1972 marks the adoption by UNESCO's General Conference of the World Heritage Convention, which now counts 194 states parties. We are approaching the 50th anniversary um, with 1,121 cultural, natural and mixed sites inscribed on UNESCO's World Heritage List in 167 countries. 1972 also marks the year when remote sensing from civilian Earth observation satellites started on a routine basis. With these two global events, more and more countries and organizations are looking into closer relationships between communities of heritage, practitioners and space technology specialists. In 2010, the World Heritage Committee recognized that the continually improving satellite imagery and other remote sensing techniques were becoming more easily available and could provide evidence over time to determine whether some impacts on World Heritage values continue to occur or are being addressed. This technology can allow authorities and site management to identify potential threats, such as gradual land use changes, grounds instability, logging, construction of illegal roads, destruction of heritage buildings that could endanger the sites in time to elaborate and implement mitigation strategies. The World Heritage Committee has since recommended the use of satellite imaging in a, a number of cases, such as the pyramid fields in Giza in Egypt, uh, the Dongfaken uh, Khao Yai forest complex in Thailand, or the tropical rainforest in Sumatra in Indonesia, to, Indonesia, to mention only a few. In 2011, the International Center for Space Technologies for Natural and Cultural Heritage, so-called HIST, was established as UNESCO Category 2 Center hosted by the Center of Earth Observation and Digital Earth in China. The center has assisted in a number of cases uh, for the use of radar technology, uh, for example, to study the stability of Angkor in Cambodia as a result of water obstruction from the city of Siem Reap. At the same time, as you know, climate change is now among the top threats to cultural sites inscribed on UNESCO's World Heritage List. Their continued preservation requires understanding these impacts on the outstanding universal value and responding to them effectively. UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee have been on the forefront addressing this threat since 2005, leading to the adoption of a World Heritage Policy on Climate Change. And um, we did also many case studies on heritage sites under threat. Now, we are currently updating this policy on climate change, guiding 194 states parties in their efforts to protect the cultural, natural and mixed sites inscribed on UNESCO's World Heritage List. And you will see the results. You can actually watch it online in July this year. Many World Heritage sites are impacted by climate change, but they are also repositories of solutions with important options for society to mitigate and adapt to climate change, from ecosystem services to people mitigating climate change and reducing disaster risk to containing knowledge and practices will build resilience to change to come and leads us to a more sustainable future. The 2015 World Heritage Policy on Sustainable Development also emphasized the inherent potential of cultural natural heritage for reducing disaster risks and adapting to climate change. The impact of climate change is particularly critical in the context of urban heritage. 
considering the essential role of cultural heritage in the social, economic, and ecological dimensions of urban sustainable development and resilience. In this context, Earth observation, technology, and information are crucial in supporting local communities in designing multidisciplinary approaches to address climate change risks and the impacts on cultural heritage. I'm therefore very pleased about the launch of the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory, a great opportunity to collectively address climate change impacts affecting urban heritage, as well as sharing Earth observation tools, practices, and expertise to protect, manage, and promote our heritage sites. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wessler. And we are very much excited to initiate this collaboration. Now, I invite the Director of Geosecretariat, Professor Gilberto Camara, to take the floor for his opening remarks. Gilberto? Yeah, thank you, Evangelos, and thanks, Dr. Hersler, for a very, very good uh, summary of what's at stake with the Urban Climate, uh, Urban Heritage uh, Climate Observatory. Uh, your nice words are very resonant yeah. with our community. Uh, the Geo Secretariat is uh, delighted to have you all here today to the launch of this new community activity, which combines uh, the expertise uh, of UNESCO, the expertise of GEO, to work together uh, for uh, addressing a very significant problem to which uh, has been explained by Dr. Hustler. Essentially, we're talking about the issue of urban resilience. Uh, the adaptation to the, let's say, the climate change that is coming is essential for our cities and for our populations. And we are delighted that the, uh, in the flagship, the status of the urban heritage sites and the heritage cities from uh, UNESCO is part of us. For those of you who don't know GEO, GEO is an international partnership of 113 UN member countries plus 130 international participating organizations. What is our aim? Our aim is to make data open and make applications of that data open. Essentially, we are concerned about making Earth observation data available to communities, countries, institutions worldwide. We understand that, uh, as explained by Dr. Hustler, that Earth observation can play a major role in understanding what's happening to our cities. And if we are to understand what happens to our cities, we then we can take informed action. So in that sense, we know that cities are key for tackling climate change. We know that they are, of course, responsible for the emissions and they're vulnerable to many of the threats posed by climate change. In that sense, the idea of the urban agenda that is being set up by the UN Habitat to which GEO has made one of its engagement priorities has become a very important uh, achievement and, and uh, aim for us. We have uh, the pleasure of having the Greek Jew office headed by Evangelos and his team and other professors candidates here, uh, which are going to address this issue from a very strong scientific background. And this helps us a lot to engage with UNESCO in this activity because we have a backing of science and therefore uh, providing what we think is essential for this world, which is uh, okay, science-based, evidence-based policy. So we really think that this is a major step forward for GEO. We think everybody which is present virtually at the launch of the Urban, Urban Heritage Climate Observatory We'd like to thank the Greek Geo Office with uh, UNFCCC, who is here together, the coalitions of mayors, and uh, obviously UNESCO for joining us in this important partnership. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And it's a great honor for, for Geo to be part of this endeavor. Thank you so much. We thank you, Gilberto. Uh, we appreciate the support provided by this new secretariat to this new community activity. And uh, we thank you personally for the guidance and the encouragement you have been generously giving to us all these years. 
to initiate important activities such as this under the umbrella of uh, GEO. Thank you very much. It's time to move on to our keynote presentations. And our first speaker is Mr. George Kremlis, principal advisor to the Greek prime minister and head of the coordination unit that supports the flexible mechanism established at UN level to protect cultural and natural heritage from climate change impacts. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Evangelos. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to be part of this launch event for the GEO UNESCO Urban Heritage Climate Observatory. A very important and instrumental initiative which will, will be working hand in hand with uh, the Greek initiative and the flexible mechanism at uh, UN level that uh, I will have now the opportunity uh, to present to you all. I would like to praise your initiative and uh, to wish you a successful activity. The Greek initiative uh, with the United Nations is aiming to protect cultural heritage and, uh, and natural heritage, monuments of the nature from climate change impacts. Next, please. It has started uh, with an international conference uh, which took place on 21 and 22 June 2019 in Athens, uh, followed by a September 2019 uh, UN Climate Action Summit where the Greek proposal was launched with the supporting partnership of UNESCO and uh, WMO entitled Addressing Climate Change Impacts on Cultural and Natural Heritage and a strong statement from our Prime Minister. Then in December 2019, the proposal was uh, presented together with uh, uh, follow-up in a side event at uh, COP25 in Madrid. Next, please. Now, the flexible mechanism, and this is the flow chart that uh, I would like to share with uh, you, is uh, something that we are uh, jointly uh, operating with uh, uh, UNESCO and uh, with the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, the three members of uh, the flexible mechanism are uh, uh, Paula Leoncini Bartoli representing UNESCO, Jurg Lutherbacher representing WMO. He is with us following this event and uh, in a communication that I had with him yesterday, he is praising uh, your initiative. The flexible mechanism is a sort of uh, steering uh, committee that will further promote and uh, support. Uh, the uh, Greek initiative. Of course, we are cooperating with uh, ICOMOS, Europa Nostra. We will add your, uh, uh, your logo, the, the GEO UNESCO uh, logo of the observatory uh, on our flow chart. And uh, the flexible mechanism is uh, supported by some kind of secretariat, which is a coordination unit uh, that was established uh, uh, through a decision of our Prime Minister. I have the, the pleasure to lead this with uh, eminent scientists, members of the Greek Academy, Professor Derefos, Professor Sinolakis, Professor Katalis, all well known to your community and Ambassador Lupas. The coordination unit is supported by experts and scientists. And uh, around the coordination unit, we have established a network of focal points uh, coming from the more than 100, uh, almost 110 now with the participation of the United States, countries that uh, are supporting this uh, initiative uh, at the Greek initiative at UN level. Next, please. Now, 
the objectives are to address this emblematic issue. We want to highlight the link between climate change impacts, culture, our cultural heritage, which is linked to the history of the humanity, the cultural sites that have been, uh, of course, identified uh, by UNESCO, and the World Heritage, but also environmental sites representing the green capital of our planet. And uh, in that respect, small island states of the oceans that are threatened because of the rise of the sea level will be part uh, of uh, this initiative. So in reality, we want to mainstream uh, climate change into uh, climate change policies uh, and uh, in all uh, the processes, uh, mainstream culture in the climate change policies and uh, highlight the links between them and of course between them and uh, uh, the environment in line with the Paris Agreement, which of course is not focusing on the, the cultural dimension, but hopefully in the upcoming COP26, we will have the opportunity, I will tell you more on that, to highlight uh, these uh, links with the SDGs that have a broad uh, scope considering uh, the policies and recommendations by UNESCO. Now, as I have mentioned, the flexible mechanism will implement the initiative and raise awareness. And of course, the coordination unit will be the day-to-day -day, uh, secretariat uh, to support the initiative. Uh, the local, uh, the network of uh, focal points uh, uh, has been created, it is expanding, and of course we want to bridge the scientific knowledge and promote new adaptation tools, uh, be it uh, satellite, be it uh, digital economy, artificial intelligence, and of course the idea is uh, to promote circular economy. Your initiative is extremely important, as Dr. Kressler has said, because more than 80% of the people of the planet live in the so-called urban or peri-urban environment, which is suffering a lot because of uh, air atmospheric uh, pollution, uh, because of uh, PM 2.5, uh, PM 10, and uh, which uh, uh, hosts the urban and peri-urban environment, important uh, sites, both cultural and environmental, that uh, need uh, to be protected. So in that uh, respect, uh, your initiative uh, uh, and your observatory will be instrumental uh, for uh, the flexible mechanism and uh, for the work that uh, we are planning to carry out. Next, please. We have already launched, prepared a questionnaire. The idea is to map the sites, starting, of course, with uh, the UNESCO ones, uh, the monuments, uh, and, of course, uh, the environmental uh, uh, monuments, if I may say so, uh, to identify the climate change impacts on them. Uh, that is to say, the, the climate uh, footprint, uh, the country's needs, uh, and of course, uh, uh, other sites which are not uh, covered by the UNESCO sites, uh, which the countries concerned might wish uh, to have uh, taken uh, on board. Uh, this questionnaire uh, is now shared uh, with uh, UNESCO and WMO, and uh, we hope that soon we will have uh, their final comments with the view to finalizing it and sharing it uh, uh, not only with our focal points, but more broadly with all the interested parties. The idea is following the, the questionnaire and the, the questionnaire, as I mentioned, will map uh, all uh, uh, the sites uh, and uh, 
it will expand uh, to sites that uh, have not been uh, mapped by uh, UNESCO. Uh, we will uh, proceed uh, with uh, the development of the digital identity of uh, each site that uh, needs to be protected. Uh, and of course, we will use uh, um, uh, all the necessary tools uh, to do so, including uh, digital economy. And uh, last uh, but not least, uh, in uh, identifying uh, the natural capital, namely the monuments of nature, we will be based, of course, on the work that has been carried out by uh, UNESCO, which is very important on the biospheres, but uh, there is additional work that needs to be carried out in relation to other networks, for example, the Natura 2000 network of the EU or the Emerald network, which is a network of the neighborhood uh, uh, policy countries or other networks in other, in other countries of the planet. So the idea is to establish a database where the sites will be mapped they will be digitalized, best practices will be shared, recorded, uh, strategies, actions, gaps in knowledge, um, um, satellite uh, and other um, um, digital economy tools, etc. And in that respect, the group on Earth observations, uh, the geo and the satellite monitoring to protect cultural heritage from climate change impacts, which is developed in cooperation with UNESCO, will be a key tool, will be uh, instrumental. We will work hand in hand uh, to promote and uh, to develop this important work. Next, please. So uh, awareness raising, uh, we have started uh, with a webinar chaired uh, by Mechthild uh, uh, under the Italian presidency, a successful one uh, uh, with, uh, in the context of uh, G20. There will be a culture ministerial. This is good news because uh, Italy wants to highlight the relationship between uh, culture and the climate uh, change. And uh, hopefully there will be a reference uh, to our initiative. Uh, there, uh, there are other initiatives, for example, a uh, master's degree that uh, is developing uh, uh, in Greece, uh, which you can see on, uh, on, uh, on this overhead. And last but not least, and this is the important message, and I will be finishing with this, we are planning uh, to organize a joint meeting of ministers of environment and culture within the frame of COP26, to discuss the climate change impacts on cultural and natural uh, heritage. Of course, uh, UNESCO and WMO uh, will be involved and you all uh, as uh, key players in this uh, important exercise. The idea is uh, to highlight the importance of this uh, emblematic initiative and uh, to have it reflected in the conclusions uh, and uh, in the report uh, of uh, uh, COP26. My last overhead uh, is uh, with uh, uh, some uh, the, the address uh, and uh, the data, please, uh, next uh, of uh, our initiative uh, and our database uh, that uh, you can all visit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George. Uh, from our end and wherever possible, we will provide all uh, technological advances deriving from the exploitation of Earth observation and scientific robustness, as Gilberto pointed out, to support uh, the Greek initiative. So thank you very much. I now call upon Dr. Joanna Post, the Program Manager Officer for Research and Systematic Observation at the UNFCCC Secretariat to speak uh, to us on the overall international climate policy framework and the role of science and earth observation community in the policy making process. Joanna, the is yours. Thank you very much, Evangelos, and uh, thank you very much to Gio and the team for inviting me to this uh, very exciting launch today. I wanted to take some uh, few moments to, to speak on the role of earth observations and its, its importance uh, for implementing the 
UNFCCC and, and specifically the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. Um, the UNFCCC provides the foundation for multilateral action on it to combat climate change and, and combat um, all of the terrible impacts that, that uh, we are already experiencing on climate change and, and look, to, look for um, science-based solutions. Uh, it's a party-driven process, so it's governments that are actually uh, taking the, um, the decision-making uh, within our process and also acting on those mandates. However, there's a, a huge uh, role for science in support and, and observations in supporting this work. The Paris Agreement recognized very strongly that it's not just about mitigation, uh, it's also about adaptation. So we need to think how we, how we uh, respond to the impacts that are unavoidable on climate change, while at the same time, of course, uh, addressing very, very uh, strongly the, the need for mitigation for the reduction of fossil fuel emissions. There are some key instruments that uh, are mandated under our work, uh, particularly under the Paris Agreement. Uh, most of you have probably heard of nationally determined contributions, which are though it, those intentions that parties uh, provide their sort of plans of, of, of action for mitigation and adaptation under the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> and specifically uh, in, in regards to adaptation is the natural adaptation plan process, which is, is a lot more involved. And I'll speak on that in, in a moment about building a process for uh, deciding on um, key uh, priorities and plans for adaptation and, and then acting on those plans. Next slide, please. So science is really, as, as with um, many buildings uh, and many processes, they need uh, rich and strong foundations. And that is very much where science uh, lies in our process. Um, we think of it really in a, in a value chain. Observations are, of course, uh, the, the very foundation of that value chain. And, and GEO lies actually in, in that box as well as, as in terms of the services it provides. Um, then, of course, the research uh, that builds on those observations and advises those, those needs as well is, is part of that work. Um, the IPCC has a strong role in our process in terms of gathering up peer-reviewed information and providing assessment reports and special reports. And then that all feeds into the policy process at, at two levels, really, at the national level to support decision making by parties and to support their action on, on climate change with uh, a supporting environment involving technology and finance and, and capacity building. And it also uh, feeds into the process in terms of the, um, at the, at the process level in terms of how to assess progress under, under the UNFCCC. Um, and very much the, the these foundation is, is a really important part of, of this decision making and the, not just the, the action in itself, but also the services, the communication, the, the addressing the science policy uh, uh, um, exchange is, is, is really extremely important. Next slide. So the Paris Agreement, this is a very, uh, very um, broad overview of the, the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015 set a limit to global warming. It, it's, it um, urged parties to enhance adaptive capacity, resilience and low emission development and to have finance compatible with sustainable development. And the Paris Agreement is a, is a legally binding instrument with um, universal um, uh, membership now. And it starts really with national measures with the nationally determined contribution, as I mentioned, action on, based on those, uh, on those national measures, uh, progress reports that are, will be provided through or are provided through an enhanced transparency framework then at the global level, there's a global stock take that will take place for the first time in 2023 and then every five years to look at uh, the aggregated um, progress under the Paris Agreement, we'll provide recommendations. And then we'll, um, parties will every five years increase their ambition under the Paris Agreement. So addressing climate change, of course, will, is, is important, will um, help reduce impact of uh, impact of uh, the, the the really serious work so that as i said the um, the uh, mitigation is an extremely important part of this and the national adaptation plan process helps understand what uh, how parties can address the um, adaptation that's unavoidable next slide please and the national adaptation plan process has four main elements 
there's the laying the groundwork, the bringing in of the science, bringing in of the information, the co-production of knowledge. Um, then a, a planning process, if you like, the implementation, and of course the reporting back on that work. And it's a it's meant to be an organic process to, to move things forward. And Earth observation is extremely important, not just for providing the data to for adaptation, but Increasingly, as we move forward to provide the information to look at how we're doing on adaptation and, and how progress is, is, is moving forward. And part of the uh, National Adaptation Plan process has, has a very uh, clear set of, of guidelines um, of how to, how to um, address uh, and, and build a National Adaptation Plan. And there's a number of supporting uh, guidelines as well, and that includes one from, from UN Habitat on addressing urban and human settlement issues in national adaptation plans. So this, these um, national adaptation plan process, it's an integrated process, it integrates with the SDGs as well, uh, and, and there's support from, from the UNFCC Secretariat and, and others to, to, um, to for parties to, to build their national adaptation plans and, and then of course, to, to implement them with the appropriate financing. Next slide, please. So as it stands at the moment, uh, a number of countries have started their um, developing their plans um, and there is um, funding available under the um, Green Climate Fund to develop plans. And then th those plans, of course, need to be implemented. That, of course, is a greater challenge. Um, and of course, there's a number of support programs out there. And this is, uh, the, there is, uh, next slide, please. There's a number of these national adaptation plans are already uh, considering the, um, national heritage um, as a priority in their plans. Um, about 14 out of the 22 national adaptation plans received by the Secretariat already references uh, the need for adaptation in regards to heritage properties. And this, of course, will undoubtedly increase, I imagine, as, as, as uh, more national adaptation plans are submitted to the Secretariat. Next slide, please. So as we move forward, I th think it's important to, to realize that um, the Earth observation needs to be there, obviously, for the countries to identify their priorities. Uh, many of those priorities are, are, will be supported by the work of the Urban Heritage um, Observatory. Um, but it's also important to, to br bridge this uh, communication uh, gap between the information available and, and the decision making, not just on what needs to be done, on, but on implementing it as well as we move forward. So, so the opportunities here are immense. Um, it's important to design, uh, design this work, uh, design adaptation plans built on the best available science to use geospatial information to analyze this work uh, um, in terms of climate change scenarios moving forward as well. And really to, to stress that um, we need not just information uh, now to, to build these plans and to support developing countries to develop their adaptation plans, but to help uh, identify how to measure that adaptation over time. And this would this addressing some of these challenges is, it would really enhance uptake of Earth, Earth observation to, to promote this uh, idea of, of this value chain, not just moving forward, but bringing this information back and identifying gaps that are needed back to the observation. And I think GEO is in, in the perfect position to, to do this. The next slide, please. So uh, I wish the, uh, the Urban Observatory uh, all the best. I think uh, it's a very exciting way forward and there's a lot of opportunities to support parties in our process and to to really make the most of, uh, of the information that's available and to to really build on some of the work that's already being uh, undertaken to to adapt to climate change in, in these highly sensitive urban areas and with that I'd like to thank you and uh, pass the floor back to evangelist thank you very much uh, joanna that was really very informative thank you uh, moving to the next, what is it that cities need to prepare for climate change? Dr. San McDaniel, Director of Data Strategy of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, will provide us with insights on why cities matter in the fight for climate change. Shannon? 
Thank you so much, Evangelos, and thank you to all of my fellow speakers. I'm very pleased to be here. I couldn't have asked for a better path to be laid than what Joanna has just said, so I will certainly be building upon uh, pretty much everything you just laid out, Joanna, re regarding the need for data and the need for geospatial observation uh, interpretation so that it can be useful for the end user in cities in this case in the work that they're trying to do to identify and address climate change. I'm the Director of Data Strategy with the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. We represent over 10,000 cities and just shy of about 1 billion people. So quite, quite a big group, but certainly not everyone in the world yet. Our, our hope is that we continue to grow. So next slide, please. The reason cities are so important is because, of course, most, most half of the world lives in urban areas already. And with that half that lives there, they are producing roughly 80% of the emissions that are impacting the world. We anticipate, as we see projections of population growth and concentration, that cities will continue to be very important and continue to grow. And one piece that is missed very frequently is that NDCs do not usually account for the impact of cities. So the decisions that are happening and being committed to by national governments, which are incredibly important, are often disconnected from those that are in the control or that can happen from the city level. And that means that sometimes the commitments being made could be even further enhanced if they had the input from cities and from the actions that cities can take. Next slide, please. Now, one of the great challenges for cities is that although they represent uh, in urban areas where more than 50% of the world lives, they also account for, this number should be higher, it's more like 80% of global CO2 emissions, and they consume nearly 70% of the world's energy. None of that is really taken into consideration in terms of what localized decisions can happen at the government level, at the local government level so that they can um, make changes and address climate change and impact that's affecting their citizens, as well as plan for how to increase resilience for their cities, which is extremely critical. Something that we have focused heavily on in, as, a, as a whole group in the climate change sphere has been very much around emissions because we all know it's incredibly critical to cut emissions if we're to have any success of being successful with uh, aligning with the Paris Agreement and staying below a two degree increase. However, uh, adaptation has been a little bit pushed to the side in that process. And more and more, the, the world of adaptation is coming more to the surface and there's more of a focus on why it is so critical and why resilience matters so greatly. I, I had a question just last week on a separate panel asking me if the focus on adaptation and resilience meant that we were, that all was lost and that now we are in a situation where we we've, we can abandon all hope because climate change has come and we've destroyed the earth. And I thought that was really interesting. It was, it was from a young person and, I, and my response was absolutely not. You know, resilience and adaptation is, is why hope is not lost. <laughs> and we need an incredible focus on it in order to be able to ensure that while we're focusing on the challenges around mitigation, we're also increasing and identifying what is important within the urban sphere in particular and protecting populations. And one of the pieces that we, that we need to protect is certainly that of cultural observation. You know, it, humans are, ourselves, we are not separate from the impact of climate change and we are, we are subject to it and we are also cause of it, but we are not separate from the environment. We are a part of the environment. So one of the challenges here is not only to be able to preserve many of our cultural um, heritage and, and our identity in the best way possible, but also to realize that we have to account for the behaviors that we have and to have, as was said very early in the call today or in the panel, we need a, a huge cultural shift in order to be able to identify the things that uh, are an integral here in order for us to be successful. So we cannot simply take measures that, uh, that, that create change, we need to have systemic change in behavior from our societies as a whole in order to uh, move forward and to progress. And that means we need to identify what is important to us as a society. And one of those things are the things that are culturally relevant and important for us to save from our history. And it's also a, a reconfiguring of how we think about the vulnerable and the, the just change of the just approach to climate change that we need to have as well. Next slide, please. 
it's already been shown in multiple reports that there is a path forward in the ability to transition to low carbon investments for cities. We know that there are economic returns that are attractive, and in particular, these are focused around policies that affect building retrofitting, a change of the type of material that is used in buildings, different policies around what is allowable. We know there's a huge impact on the, from the transport sector and the upgrades that can happen there. Obviously, a change in how many cars are allowed in a city, you know, more use of public transport, and an emphasis on denser urban areas to facilitate all of that. Those changes can absolutely make a big difference going forward. And we already know that there are policies that could be put in place to help support that from the national level to the local level as well. Next slide, please. And one of the pieces that cities need and urban policymakers need is they need information. So this is where we circle back to the geospatial data and earth, earth observation information. We have to have data that not only is available, but also accessible. And building upon what Joanna was saying, we also align and partner with UN Habitat and promote the development of adaptation plans, very similar in principle to what Joanna has laid out. So the risk and vulnerability evaluation, a decision around what kind of actions you would take as a result, you know, implementation of those actions and showing progress on them. And there, and, and identification also of uh, societal impact. So making sure that the most vulnerable populations are identified and protected equally, if not more so than, than the citizens as a whole. But we need in the city space, uh, an increase of investment in science and research so that we can have evidence-based and science-based policy decision-making. We need um, innovation and technology. So we need investment from national government systems into the local systems uh, and urban systems and academics uh, so that we can have more opportunities identified and solutions that can be brought forth and scaled to bring uh, the right solutions for cities and for citizens. But the biggest thing we need to underpin all of that is data. So in the world we live in today, there is no lack of data. Data is collected on every breath you take for lack of a better term. And the truth is that although that data exists, it's not so easy to use. So what we find is that there's a huge gap between availability or the, the no, knowledge that information might exist and the actual ability to use that knowledge in a way that makes sense for someone like a city decision maker, a policy maker. So the request is really to not only identify what information is necessary to feed into the development of climate action plans and at a local level as well as a national level and earth observation data can certainly help support those efforts, but it has to be digestible in a way that is actually useful for cities. So if we don't make it useful or um, actionable for city policy makers, then we quickly run into a space where we need a lot of technical capacity to support the use of that information and even identifying what information has to be made. So as the Global Covenant of Mayors, we have a huge range of cities, some that are very sophisticated and have quite a lot of support within their technical staff, very large resource budgets, and they are you know, they've been doing things like developing climate action plans consistently for the past 25 years. And then we have cities that are quite small, that are maybe a handful of people. And they also have just as much interest in ensuring that whatever decisions they make, whatever planning they choose to do is consistent with the best decision possible. But the, the difference between having a team of 25 people to help you develop a climate action plan and um, someone who has a mayor that tells them, go join the Global Covenant of Mayors and figure out what you're supposed to do is quite vast. Fortunately, we have a large network of partners to support this, but even with all the partners engaged, it's still not enough. As, as you know, technical capacity and building that is, is quite difficult. It takes a lot of resources. And so what we can do as a community is move to a space where we identify what the critical activities are, what the critical actions are. So how can we use the data that we already have and the expertise in the data and scientific community to help already set cities into a direction where they feel like they have some basic understanding without having to uh, necessarily join something special or pay for uh, some sort of interpretation or access? You know, can we move into a space where we help facilitate that information exchange in a way that is far more intuitive? And I would argue that in the technological space in which we currently reside as the world, 
that we have the facility to identify what that means. You know, what is it that uh, makes something easy to use? If I uh, use the example of a baby that's handed a cell phone, you can see that a small baby knows how to tap on a screen and switch to different apps. We've all seen our children or friends of our friends that have children do these amazing sort of intuitive behaviors. And that's what we need in the climate change data space. We need more intuitive uh, opportunities and support so that information can be used and leveraged in an appropriate way. And that in terms of cities, they feel supported to make decisions because they understand what is necessary in a more uh, organic fashion. Next slide, please. We have a couple of uh, attempts that we've made in this realm. <laughs> we have developed with the World Resources Institute something we call the Data Portal for Cities. And the, the, op, the effort here was to take national data, so data that's available at the national government level, and downscale it to the city level. We call this proxy data because the best data you could have would be data that you observe and collect yourself and know um, its accuracy. When you downscale, you lose a little bit because you're applying a, a very rough filter, something maybe like based on population. So it's still good data. It's just not the best data you could have. Um, but we've made this available for 60,000 cities and we're hoping to continue to expand it. For now, it only contains data reflecting uh, mitigation. So only gases and what you would use for an emissions inventory. But we are hoping to expand it to include data that reflects um, information you need to do an adaptation plan as well and to make decisions around resilience and risk. Now that requires quite a large effort and it's not something that we will likely be able to just do on our own or going um, from national government to national government and asking for that information. I think this will require more of a community effort to really help build out the best we can on what those, that information should look like and how to make it the most easily accessible. And next slide, please. And finally, we have a partnership with Google and something called the Environmental Insights Explorer that has been developed. And I, I will drop the URLs for both of these tools into the chat so that you can also have a look. These tools are, uh, this tool in particular, uh, also is mitigation focused for now. It contains information around building emissions and it contains transport sector emissions as well as uh, solar rooftop. The Google Insights is starting to explore further out. They've done some air quality uh, measures as well, as well as a uh, pilot project with shade and the change of forest and habitat over time. Now, many of these tools, um, again, they provide very nice insight and ability to look at information. And for someone who has a sophisticated enough team, i.e. a researcher or someone that can understand the information, they could pull that data in and apply that to their city. But it is not at the necessarily city level or even national government level to help you take decisions. And so I'll just finish here because I think this is my last slide and say that what, what is desperately needed is that link, that connection that Joanna also referred to, that we have a gap between the information that exists and having it in the actual usable form so that we can then support the end users in making strong decisions that are really necessary to quickly take in these coming days. Thank you so much for your time. That was excellent, Salon. Thank you very much. Cities are really complex environments, but also where most opportunities uh, lie and would, uh, we would certainly want to have cities on board. And uh, especially, uh, with the fourth engagement priority that Gilberto talked about, uh, which is on urban resilience. Actually, we talk it, uh, we uh, call it uh, resilient cities and human settlements. Uh, we uh, really want to dig into this issue of uh, that it's not just enough to have availability and accessibility to data. It's important to have ready to uptake and digestible tool, tools and services uh, for city stakeholders. And I think that's what this forum stands for to co-design and talk together so that we make it uh, uh, more efficient uh, at the end. So thank you very much for this. Our last but not least uh, speaker is Dr. Christina Ananasso, Project Officer in the Earth Observation Unit, DG Defense, Industry and Space, the European Commission. Christina is going to present to us Copernicus contribution to the cultural heritage community of users. Christina, please. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. 
So good, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, event and I found it very useful. And all, thank you for my predecessor to the presentation, the very interesting presentation that give uh, an overview of the wide context in which we are moving. I'm going to present uh, the Copernicus uh, uh, program, a very high overview of the program itself, and I want to tell you um, how I think uh, Copernicus can contribute to the cultural heritage community of users in general, and in particular to this uh, new observatory that is uh, very, uh, very interesting for us. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so, I, um, what is Copernicus and uh, why we call it as a user-driven program? And I will come back also to this definition that is quite important for the uh, European Commission and for the Copernicus program in particular. What we have already done in the cultural heritage domain, and I will show you some action that we have done in the in the past few years and we want to continue in the next future and i want to give you an overview of some uh, concrete example on how copernicus can be useful for cultural heritage and i hope that with my presentation i will uh, bring also some uh, uh, help uh, and support to the um, to my colleague shannon that uh, complained a little bit on some gap that is there and uh, all of us recognize uh, this gap and probably Copernicus already started to um, yeah to fill this gap with some easily usable information not only earth observation data but something more than earth observation data can you go to the next slide please so what is Copernicus? I don't know if all of you are aware of it. Copernicus is the Earth Observation and Monitoring Program of the European Commission. The core of the program are the six services that use Earth observation data coming from the Sentinel that are the dedicated uh, space component to the program and coming from also contribution, contributing mission coming from national mission. Um, this data together with the in-situ measurement and together with the, um, modeling, uh, 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 modeling techniques will give you added value products and information. All these data, all these products are full, free and open. So they are accessible to everybody and can be used by everybody. Next slide, please. As I told you before, the core of the program are the services. Uh, there are three services dedicated to a specific uh, environment, the marine monitoring service, the land uh, monitoring service, and the atmosphere. And then uh, uh, other three services that are more cross-cutting, uh, climate change, security, and emergency management service. What we have done in the past, uh, um, focusing more on the cultural heritage, we started in 2017 with a workshop. Uh, because really, as I told, as I said at the beginning, the user have for us the core of our activities. So we want to get more closer to the user and we organized uh, several workshop of this kind. And in, the, in this particular case, uh, our counterpart were the cultural heritage uh, user, uh, user communities. Um, the main suggestion that we receive from this uh, from this uh, workshop was really the importance of having earth observation uh, data and uh, information based on earth observation data really used in different uh, in different domain then in 2018 we we continue with an internal study uh, done by pwc on the Copernicus services in support to cultural heritage. Here, the idea is really to assess the Copernicus capability in support of cultural heritage activities based on well-identified user need and outline some requirements for enhancement or for the production 
of new earth observation based uh, base data. And this study started in the conclusion to recommend to the Commission some uh, potential uh, scenario to implement a kind of dedicated service to Calpur Valley. Our member states, the member state part of the Copernicus Committee, were very much involved in this, uh, in this uh, uh, area of interest, and they decided, they asked to the Commission to have a cultural heritage task force that will continue in some way the, 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 yeah, the study done by PwC, but bringing together in this context uh, national members state national um, expert coming from both the earth observation domain and the cultural heritage domain and uh, the work that was done was uh, very important uh, for us because uh, it created an important map between uh, national uh, requirement and uh, uh, copernicus response uh, to this uh, to this requirement uh, now we are in the situation which we started, uh, we started, yes, in 2021, the definition for uh, the future of uh, Copernicus for the next uh, multi-annual financial framework from 2021 to 2027. And there was, a, there is an ongoing discussion uh, to uh, implement not a service per se, but uh, we call it a thematic hub on cultural heritage that is a kind of cross-service uh, platform, let's call it this way, to better uh, respond to these uh, new and emerging uh, user needs. There is also an ongoing discussion um, mainly related to the land monitoring service with uh, UNESCO to uh, support the monitoring of some uh, world natural heritage uh, site. Next slide, please. Now I will go through very quickly and just to give you some example, but there is uh, there are much more products that can be used in this context. Uh, this is the Copernicus Climate Change Service that uh, can support uh, the cultural and natural heritage sector with, the, uh, with uh, providing a lot of uh, data, long time series, but not only data. Uh, as was addressed before by, by Shannon, there is also a kind of support, expert support that can help in uh, using these data. On the right hand side of the slide, there is the list of some essential climate variable and in red are reported the ones more relevant for cultural heritage, precipitation, sea level, soil moisture, land cover and, and fire, for example. And I want to underline that the ECMWF that is in charge of this Copernicus climate change will organize a workshop in July uh, to in some way reopen the discussion at least for Copernicus in this uh, with the uh, with the cultural heritage uh, uh, user and to listen to their needs and your needs to better um, evolve also some uh, products already already there. Can you go to the next slide, please? This, uh, this is the other Copernicus service, that is the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service that obviously provide, can provide some uh, products related to air quality and UV radiation at different and also related to fires and emission. Uh, depending on the scale, uh, there is a 10 uh, kilometer at the European level, but also at world level with a resolution of 40, 40 kilometers. This is an example of a project already developed in the atmosphere service Discover that is uh, together with the GRI for, for, for Athens in particular and the use of this data not only for cal cultural heritage as it is but for the tourist sector in, in general. Next slide. Another example is coming from the land monitoring service that will uh, provide a useful product for biodiversity and general cultural heritage. And next slide, please. 
um, this is another important aspect uh, coming uh, and uh, support that can come from the Copernicus Emergency Management Service, where we have two different uh, um, sub-service, let's call them this way, on the map, on demand mapping that you have to you you can ask for uh, when something happens so it's a very on demand and fast response to some specific requirement and early warning and monitoring service covering at least three of the main uh, the main natural emergency floods fire and uh, drought can you go to the next slide Another important uh, service that can bring uh, support is for sure the Copernicus service in support to the um, European Union external action. And this is an example of a map for conflict, uh, for a conflict damage assessment where these, uh, uh, where some site cannot be accessible due to conflict. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the last service and uh, this is the Copernicus Marine uh, Environmental Monitoring Service with all different kind of product that can be, uh, can be used and can be provided uh, cover, uh, covering especially the uh, cultural heritage, uh, cultural heritage uh, domain. Uh, my last slide, just to conclude, I would like to say that, okay, um, Copernicus is there, it's operational since some years already, is uh, globally well recognized for its high quality data and well documented data processing. And uh, again, I want to underline the fact that the data and the information are free and, uh, and open. As the European Commission, we have done a lot of other work in, uh, in several uh, initiatives, in several actions, in particular under the a research flagship program like uh, FP7, Horizon 2020, and for sure we will continue with, uh, with Horizon Europe. Um, climate change, urban monitoring, and cultural heritage are already part of the Copernicus program, even if uh, with a different uh, dimension, obviously. And um, I can say that the Commission is uh, well aware of the importance of the cultural heritage at uh, global, European, national, but really at all, also at a very uh, local scale. And uh, as I said at the beginning, Copernicus is a user-driven program and our mandate is really to respond to this uh, new and emerging uh, user need. And the idea to address this with the, as I called before, thematic hub that are thematic cross service uh, area of interest is a way to concretely address some of these uh, requests coming from our our user community. So thank you again for for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. So really impressive and demonstrates the great potential of Earth observation in the cultural heritage domain. and. Uh, that there are already tools out there that we need to bring together and to communicate to other communities as well. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, before I hand it over to Sarah, uh, Climate Coordinator of the Geo Secretariat, our Q&A session moderator, I would like to thank all keynote speakers for the inspiring presentations that really shed light on different uh, aspects that we must take into consideration within the works of the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory. Sarah? Hi, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to this short uh, Q&A session. Uh, let me remind you that this is just for immediate clarification questions. Why we, I'd like to save more substance related questions for the panel discussion at the end. So I'll now look at the Q&A box where I already uh, see uh, questions popping up. Um, please keep posting your questions there if you haven't done it already. I will not take uh, raise hands at this stage in the interest of time since we are running a bit late, but don't worry, the speakers will be able to reply in the Q&A box in, in writing or I will pick it up later. I think for 
clarification only, there are two immediate questions for Christina, for Copernicus. So I will read them out loud and then let Christina answer. One is from Daniele um, Serra or Serra. Uh, how does Copernicus support change detection in conflict areas, damage detection to cultural heritage sites with the moderate spatial resolution of Sentinel satellites? And a question uh, from Adote Blim Blivi. Christina, can you explain more how with Copernicus imagery, you can see shipwrecks at 20 meter depth and more? So please, Christina. Okay, with the pre, with the first question, uh, I can say that um, okay, Copernicus is not the space component for Copernicus are not only the uh, Sentinel that uh, you know um, a quite re a resolution that is obviously not adapted to this kind of uh, monitoring, but uh, we receive and we buy, I can say. Uh, additional data coming from the contributing mission. And for specific uh, products and services, we are, we are using this data where the resolution is uh, higher. And the image that I show you before coming from the security service demonstrated that the use of this data is available and is possible to, to use it inside Copernicus. I have to say that the, the Copernicus uh, service, the, the Copernicus security service are under a different uh, data policy and only, um, uh, how to say, uh, out, um, national authority can ask for this specific uh, data. Uh, the second one is quite difficult for me. Um, obviously, uh, what I can say is that uh, the 20 meter depth uh, you can arrive with a satellite only if uh, the uh, transparency of the water is uh, quite high. So also in this case, it will depend a lot on the uh, coastal area and which kind of uh, um, data are you going to use but 20 meter is a really uh, a limit uh, i am not an expert in particular on the use of uh, earth observation data but for sure it will depend a lot on the transparency of uh, water so i cannot guarantee that uh, copernicus can see uh, 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 ever only ever at the 20 meter depth Okay, thank you, Christina, for the clarification. I see there is a follow-up question by Adote uh, talking about the relevance of um, field uh, throughting. Of course, uh, in situ uh, observations are as important as um, space-based uh, uh, observations to make uh, um, clear and sound uh, decisions. So. I will consider this uh, question answered already. And uh, I don't see any, I mean, I see a lot of comments and broader questions that I will address later for the panel discussion. But at this stage, I would just ask um, Rick to uh, resume the screen share and uh, open the second part of today's event. We are now um, going to listen to the co-leads of the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory, who will tell us more about this new initiative, how it came into being, and what is it that we are aiming to achieve to respond to the needs we have heard from the previous speakers and, and beyond. Next, please. So let me introduce you Dr. Yoti Hosgrehar, who is the Deputy Director of the World Heritage Center at UNESCO. Jyoti, please, the, the floor is, your, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And many thanks to all the speakers uh, today. It has been really a very rich discussion. And uh, I think that the, the entire range of, of points that have been raised are really, uh, uh, really exciting, really important. Um, this is a, uh, we are here today after a number of conversations uh, that have been uh, uh, and uh, the exchanges that have really uh, between very different ways of thinking, working, 
that has been a journey, uh, a way of working, and I hope a journey that will continue because it's so important to have such collaborations. So next, please. Um, the way uh, that one could look at this uh, and the way certainly we think of it is uh, that we are looking at the intersection of some very different fields of work. To begin with, of course, the work on World Heritage and the World Heritage Convention, for which we are the Secretariat at the World Heritage Center, um, specifically focusing on the cities. And I will explain in a little bit about the World Heritage Cities. And then we have the whole world of looking at climate change, climate change impacts, um, issues around adaptation mitigation. And then we have another world of work around Earth observation, um, looking at the different scales, different types of resources, products, pulling them together. And somehow uh, behind all of this, you might say, is a larger circle of sustainable development goals, because that's really at the heart of everything we do is looking at the sustainable development goals and seeing how we can support um, countries, cities uh, to move towards the sustainable development goals more um, uh, better and, and uh, more quickly. Next, please. Um, with regard to World Heritage Cities, I could start by saying that we're witnessing today um, the largest human migration in history with more than half of the world's population living in urban areas. Rapid and uncontrolled urbanization frequently results in social and spatial fragmentation and in a drastic deterioration of the quality of urban and rural environments. That's the state of cities everywhere. Um, the World Heritage Cities program is one of the six thematic programs approved and monitored by the World Heritage Committee uh, of the 1,121 World Heritage properties, which Dr. Rosler spoke about a few minutes ago. Currently, 313 are part of this thematic program as World Heritage Cities. That includes historic cities, walled cities, or parts of cities, and urban sites with a strong relationship to the community around them. Each site uh, inscribed on the World Heritage List has clearly defined property boundaries and an outstanding universal value for which it was inscribed. So on the one hand, state parties to the World Heritage Convention are obliged to protect their outstanding in this outstanding universal value. And on the other, World Heritage properties are particularly vulnerable as they must deal with the pressures of urbanization poorly planned urban initiatives, unsustainable tourism, and inadequate infrastructure, in addition to uh, the global challenges of climate change. Nearly 50% of the state of conservation reports examined at the World Heritage Committee in the last two committee meetings uh, have been in urban areas dealing with urban pressures. Next, please. The historic urban landscape recommendation emphasizes an approach that views the historic center or ensemble as uh, 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 and recognizes it as an intricate part of its larger setting, the geographical, historical, social, and cultural context. It advocates looking at the historic urban areas as composed of layers of history, economic, social, and spatial relationships between the built heritage, natural heritage, and local communities. These layers include natural and cultural, tangible and intangible, universal and local heritage values present in any city. These heritage values should be taken as a, as a point of departure in the overall management and development of the city. So the whole approach creates a shift in focus from monuments to the urban fabric as a whole and beyond the notion of the historic center. And this is important for how we can think about taking what we develop from this uh, uh, Urban Heritage Climate Observatory and be able to implement it. Next, please. More than 90% of the world's cities are coastal and a third of the world heritage cities are coastal. Historic cities are particularly at risk because many of them developed for historical reasons along the coast or along major rivers. Thus, a number of world heritage cities, nearly a third of them are along the coast, as I mentioned. 
this has an enormous influence uh, and an enormous significance for world heritage cities, but more generally for the protection of urban heritage and for sustainable development. Oh, next, please. Next, please. Um, the historic urban landscape recommendation and its approach has become the standard framework for the implementation of the World Heritage Cities Program. The 40th General Conference of UNESCO also reaffirmed the importance of the historic urban landscape recommendation in the context of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the new urban agenda and the African Union Agenda 2063 and of course, which is intimately connected to the World Heritage Sustainable Development Policy. Next, please. With rising temperatures and accompanying sea level rise, increasing risk of climate change related disasters are also on the rise. Coastal cities risk flooding from rising sea levels and powerful storm surges. Climate change is now among the top threats to cultural and natural heritage sites inscribed on UNESCO World Heritage List. And these are not, of course, the only dangers from uh, the only threats from climate change. There are many others. The continued uh, preservation uh, of World Heritage uh, properties requires understanding these impacts to their outstanding universal value and responding to them effectively. During the last World Heritage Committee meeting, a number of state of conservation reports on World Heritage cities indicated threats related to climate change. At the same time, historic cities and traditional settlements have often developed resilient features that contribute towards adapting to challenges like climate change, including by controlling carbon emissions and mitigating its impact on communities and built fabric. And you see here, of course, uh, uh, Venice and Riga and Biblos. Next, please. To give you another example, the World Heritage City of Cartagena in Colombia faces climate change impacts such as rising sea levels, increased frequency of gale force winds, and extreme heat events and torrential rains, which cause catastrophic floods. Historic, the his, historic cities such as Sana'a and Triban in Yemen, built in a hot, dry climate with mud, have been severely impacted by floods in the last couple of years. Next, please. Heritage uh, and climate change uh, is something that UNESCO has been working on uh, at the World and the World Heritage Center has taken a number of actions. Um, they have, uh, UNESCO and the World Heritage Center have been at the forefront to address this threat since 2005, leading to the adoption of the World Heritage Strategy and a World Heritage Policy on Climate Change. To continue to remain relevant, the committee is currently, uh, the World Heritage Committee is currently updating its 2007 policy on climate change, guiding the 194 state parties in their efforts to protect the 1,121 cultural, natural, and mixed sites uh, inscribed on the World Heritage List. The World Heritage Policy on Sustainable Development emphasizes what governments can do to recognize and promote the inherent potential of cultural, natural heritage for reducing disaster risks and adapting to climate change through ecosystem services, strengthened social cohesion, traditional knowledge and practices. So of course, a separate lecture is necessary to cover all of these different actions. And I just wanted to touch on a few that are currently being undertaken at the uh, World Heritage Center and at UNESCO towards the mitigation and adaptation to the impacts of climate change, including the reduced risk of related disasters. And this includes the UNESCO Task Force on Climate Change that coordinates the organizations work on climate change, the 2007 policy document on the impacts of climate change on world heritage properties, which I mentioned was currently being updated, the UNESCO Reflection Group on Culture and Climate Change, UNESCO ECOMOS IPCC co-sponsored 
um, international expert meeting on cultural heritage and climate change, including three papers which are in preparation. A follow-up committee, UNESCO, UNFCCC, Greece, requested by um, the UN Secretary General after the UN Climate Change Summit, and of course, the flexible mechanism that was already mentioned by Mr. Kremlitz uh, earlier uh, on the, the flexible mechanism established by Greece and presented at the 210th session of uh, UNESCO's uh, executive board. Next, please. And the Italian presidency G20 high level webinar, which was also mentioned earlier. And you can see a number of these documents. Um, next, please. So um, obviously, Earth observation is the expertise of uh, GEO and Greek GEO and the community members of GEO, Copernicus, for example, and so on. However, I might mention a few concerns um, from our side. Uh, we work closely with site managers and national focal points and institutions responsible for the protection of World Heritage properties. So it's possible for us to provide them support with policies and actions that they could take very directly. We know that some of the World Heritage cities have been facing problems already, as I mentioned. Data availability, because we're working across 194 states parties, is data availability is inconsistent and unequal across the world. While we have very detailed urban level data in Europe, the resolution we are able to obtain for many other parts of the world are entirely inadequate. Climate data and projections are generally available at the level of the region. So local level data and projections are not easily available with the precision for the property areas. Climate data is specialized in technical and to be able to read satellite images and climate data to make sense of it for the protection of urban heritage is the next step and to apply the data for potential adaptation projects and mitigation measures is even more so. So this is a pilot effort that we hope could eventually be scaled up to all types of World Heritage properties all over the world and inspire all countries to address their cultural and natural heritage, regardless of whether they're being, they're inscribed on the World Heritage list or not. So we see this, as I said, as a journey where we can look at many of these issues and look together to collaboratively find solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti, for a very compelling presentation on the issues around the value of her urban heritage and why it is important uh, to protect from uh, climate impacts. I would like now to give the floor to Dr. Evangelos Kerasopoulos, who you know already as the director of the Greek GEO office and a very active member of the GEO community, I can say. Um, Evangelos, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Jyoti, for setting the stage for me to, to present the Urban Heritage Climate uh, Observatory, the new geo community activity that we are talking about. Next, please. So, building from the previous presentations and discussions of the day, it becomes clear that some connections need to be made. In terms of the urgency of climate change, we have already reached the stage of climate crisis. Impacts are more evident than ever with increasing frequency, intensity, and uh, unprecedented consequences for our planet. Uh, the importance and especially the vulnerability of urban heritage is also something that we cannot neglect, uh, not only in terms of climate change, but also with respect to uncontrolled urbanization. And uh, this vicious cycle leads to deterioration of the environment we live in and irreversible impacts on world heavier assets, which then necessitates that we as humankind should exploit all weapons in our arsenal to tackle climate change and not question the untapped that uh, increasingly unknowledge potential of Earth observation can really play a significant role especially now that the discussion concentrates around digitalizing the way we observe planet Earth as an integrated way to understand its problems 
and try to fix them. Next, please. Uh, in an attempt to contribute to connecting those dots, uh, we are launching the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory community activity uh, within the group on Earth Observation, which aims to serve as a forum to bring together the interested parties and relevant stakeholders and experts in these domains, uh, determine overlaps in these names, and exploit these synergies to produce tangible outcomes to protect World Heritage cities from climate change impacts via Earth observation, among many other assets at the disposal of scientists. Next, please. How can we do this and serve as a forum? For sure, we should need to take into account and align with the main global policy frames which are relevant to the issue, like the Paris Agreement for Climate Change, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development, and the New Urban Agenda, as well as the UNESCO's frames that Kiyoti uh, referred to in her talk. Next, please. In this context, GEO seems to be the appropriate vehicle, as its three engagement priorities connect to the above policy frames. And uh, as Gilberto uh, mentioned, the director of GEO, urban resilience will soon follow on as the fourth engagement priority to complete the puzzle. This enables optimal coordination and optimization of earth observation exploitation in all these frames, as relevant activities are already realized within the work program of GEO. Next, please. So indeed, uh, GEO is the right place to have the job done. And the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory aims to serve as the connecting factor between these policy frames and the activities in GEO, and what's more, with the symbolic and also economic importance of cultural heritage, it could also serve as a push to realize climate actions and achieve specific targets. Next, please. The overarching objectives of the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory include uh, the introduction and uh, integration of Earth observation into the workflows of UNESCO, and the full range of stakeholders uh, to enable tackling and adapting to climate change with emphasis on work heritage cities. The provision of a forum for relevant partners to share practices, needs, and expertise, uh, match user needs to earth observation assets and coordinate with a bottom up approach, processes for the pres preservation, monitoring, and management of urban heritage. And finally, uh, the communication and advocacy around local, national, and international climate action. In the next slide, and along these lines, we go back in early 2020, when with the catalytic role of the Greek Geo Office, the liberations between Geo and UNESCO resulted in an open call for expression of interest to gather members of the Geo community and beyond uh, with an overwhelming response. And the critical mass and the momentum gain led to the development of an implementation plan for the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory to be proposed and eventually approved for inclusion in the GEO working program. Uh, from today onward, by launching this community activity, there is a number of proposed activities that will need to be realized, uh, starting with the uh, establishment of working groups focusing on interdisciplinary actions organized to bring together the different communities involved. Uh, the collection of needs, data, and global good practices, which will allow us uh, to identify the opportunities for Earth observation to monitor aspects of World Heritage Cities. Uh, the identification and selection of pilot sites to test and refine existing and uh, new, newly developed methodologies according to systematic prioritization to be designed by the obs observatory and the definition of appropriate frame of indicators, building off of uh, UNESCO's existing work that will serve all relevant policy frames in, in an interoperable fashion. And finally, pooling the resources to conceptualize and realize a global platform. And such a platform will be hosting all relevant data deriving from Earth observation 
and combine it with urban heritage and local information for supporting global to national and city scale data-driven informed decision-making. Next, please. So uh, the vision of the initiative is to place heritage in cities uh, at the heart of local and national policies and actions for urban sustainable development and climate change adaptation. And uh, this will happen by proposing strategies for tangible local and practical solutions and mechanisms to assist member states to implement such actions to enhance resilience and reduce disaster risks in cities in conjunction with uh, conservation of urban heritage. And where feasible and relevant, contribute towards prompting mitigation actions in, in heavily polluted water heritage cities. So can we do this? In the next slide, the 75 partners from 24 countries, including 11 international organizations, guarantee that we can pull together resources at the global level to coordinate relevant efforts, avoid duplications and reduce fragmentation. We can together prioritize actions in both developing and developed countries in all continents and in an inclusive manner and make sure that our world heritage remains safe from human and nature induced climate change impact uh, before it's too late. After the overwhelmingly positive response we received from, from, from the community, uh, we are confident that this effort can substantially contribute in this regard and also providing answers to scientific questions for decision making by overlooking the planet as empowered by Earth observation. And with this slide, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Sarah? Yes, okay. Thanks, Evangelos, for such a clear presentation on the new Urban Heritage Climate Observatory, the underlying vision and, and the proposed activities. From the Geo Secretariat uh, perspective, we are, we are really pleased to have it in our work program. And I must say that we are very impressed by the interest that was raised uh, by this topical initiative among the Geo community. So well done so far. Uh, I would like now to open the panel discussion with our keynote speakers and, and the co-leads. Please all uh, turn your camera on. Uh, the discussion will be about 20 minutes, given the remaining time. And I will first ask uh, some questions to, to the panel members and then open the floor to additional questions and comments from uh, the attendees. And please keep posting your question in the Q&A box and, and speakers, please look at the, at the questions so that you can uh, also answer in, in writing. Okay. Um, so we have listened to six very insightful presentations, each providing a different perspective. Some of the presentations have highlighted the needs, others spoke to policy process and responses. In fact, we have seen there are three main elements that we can recognize in this whole discourse. The first is cultural heritage and the overall value of cities. The second is climate impacts and, and climate policy responses. And the third is earth observations and the um, derived tools and services to support decision making. It seems that these three elements have not been tackled together yet, although interesting initiatives are emerging as we have seen, and we hope we can capture those um, initiatives um, through the new Urban Heritage Climate Observatory. In fact, the, this observatory really aims to achieve a collaboration among the three different communities more explicitly. So the discussion here is about uh, bringing different perspectives to the table. And I have a, a first question for all the speakers um, just about this cooperation. So where do you see the real added value of a new initiative bringing together cities, cultural heritage, climate science, policy, and earth observation? What is new there? What is it that, that we can uh, um, offer? Who wants to go first? Can I react? Yes, please, George. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think uh, this is a holistic approach 
uh, which uh, leads to making uh, the urban and peri-urban environment uh, circular in the sense of the circular economy. In other words, to mitigate the climate and uh, the environmental impacts in, in the cities, in the urban environment with uh, the view to reducing the impacts to the cultural and natural heritage and making the two, the latter resilient. So there is clearly an added value here. And as I was mentioning before, this uh, initiative, the observatory will become a powerful instrument uh, to support the flexible mechanism at uh, UN level that uh, we are developing as we need them. We will have to work hand in hand. I was also very interested in the Copernicus uh, presentation and also in the marine environment. As you know, we have marine uh, uh, natural uh, uh, sites uh, in the European Union, Natura 2000 sites that also need to be protected. And this experience can be used also worldwide for the marine environment, which is also part of uh, the green capital uh, of our planet and which comes under the, the FM initiative. This is very relevant. Thanks, George, for uh, enlightening us uh, on this point. And uh, I see Shannon has her hands up. Yes, thank you. I, that's that's really a strong point, George. And just to build on that, I would add that that this is a real opportunity to uh, encourage people to have an emotional connection to their city and to protecting things in their city. Um, something we often overlook or maybe forget about in the climate space is that everyone truly uh, and understands and engages around what it means to have climate change. Um, as an American, I can tell you that uh, at least 150 million people on this planet don't believe it's happening <laughs> based on our most recent uh, elections. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's something that needs to be really understood and not, um, not something that needs to be dismissed. We've learned as Americans for sure that you cannot uh, assume that what is happening because it sounds so crazy to you isn't having an impact. So I feel like this is really an opportunity because culturally this would overshadow politics. Uh, the idea that you have something valuable to preserve that is part of your heritage and part of uh, your history personally, your family history, your ancestry. Um, this is something we could really rally around and encourage people to say, you know, we don't want these things to be destroyed. We want to protect them. You know, how can we build a strong communications campaign that really rallies people sort of uh, a little bit around the way rather than directly, because sometimes you have to lead by uh, by momentum and, and by something that appeals to people, not necessarily just dropping in uh, with scientific facts and assuming that everyone is going to find those credible and believable, no matter what uh, your own personal beliefs may be. Yeah, this is very true. And um, the, the issue of climate plus cultural heritage uh, make it a very, very topical uh, subject. So. Uh, we have all we need to, to raise interest, I think. Um, someone else wants to, to say something about the, the added value here? Um, maybe um, if I can, Joanna Christina. or... Can I speak, yeah. Christina? Yes. Yeah, I think that having uh, these um, different community, uh, communities uh, cultural heritage, earth observation, cities, and climate uh, policy, and all related to the policy makers around the uh, same table and discussing about uh, different kind of topics. It's quite important, particularly referring to the policy makers, because uh, sometimes it's not so obvious, but uh, part of my job here in the commission is really to bring the earth observation outside the earth observation domain. And from what I have learned in the last years, cultural heritage is really a perfect example where this process can work very well because the interests are complementary uh, and very uh, sense, sense close to the um, close to the heart of the the user. And um, 
I, the, I think that um, having a policy, really uh, putting the word earth observation, the terminology that we use in our domain inside the regulation or new legislation is quite important and it's not so, it's not so easy also, also at uh, European level because obviously then this regulation arrive at national level where uh, they should be taken into consideration. Thank you. Um, talking about regulation and uh, the European Union, I have a follow-up question here that I would like to take now. Um, do we refer to the EU Joint Communication on International Cultural Relations 2016 in any of the activities that, are, that have been mentioned here and Copernicus services maybe? Is this relevant for for um, the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory? I see a question from Dian on the Q&A. Uh, more in general about the framework, uh, the, the regulation at the European level that we are addressing. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the, the, the legislation that you are mentioning now. Uh, but if it's in uh, 2016, maybe it's too early, at least for Copernicus. So the, uh, Copernicus became operational in 2015, 2016. So now we can really uh, see uh, how to develop further the, the, the program, not only focusing on the specific services or not only focusing on the space component that should be for sure developed that continue to, to develop it in the future, but we can also tackle different uh, domains, like for example, cultural heritage. So um, I, I can bring this as a generic um, response for, for the entire Copernicus uh, uh, program. Now I, we can go toward our, uh, toward other uh, European DGs to foster and to support the use of Earth observation data in uh, in the different contexts. Indeed, as as George mentioned, uh, this needs to be a holistic approach, uh, not just uh, across communities, but also across uh, you know vertically uh, and horizontally. So um, we will need to have a, a broader um, stakeholder engagement, uh, of course. And this is the case because the initiative already has uh, almost 80 partners in it. So it's quite uh, comprehensive. Um, I have, uh, well, still on the question about the val added value, was there anyone else who wanted to, to say if something? I may, if I may jump in here for a very quick comment. Yes. I mean, uh, first of all, I fully share what Christina said that uh, cultural heritage uh, can serve as a connecting factor uh, as we also mentioned, and also that there are things that we take for granted, which is not the case, unfortunately. I'm talking about uh, creating a common language, uh, talking with the cities uh, within the new uh, fourth engagement priority. We realized that this was not always uh, the case. Communicate achievements, uh, Christina also mentioned this, uh, things that are uh, coming out from Copernicus or other entities, uh, it's not necessarily well known to other communities. And this is uh, for us a very important message to uh, com uh, convey. And uh, what's more, we should stop initiating projects from scratch. It's very important that we build off of achievements already inherited from past projects and all together, you know, make the next uh, steps. This, I think, is going to be one of the added values coming from this community activity. Thank you, Evangelos. That's uh, that's very true. And we really hope that uh, something good will come out of, of this, as for all the other um, geo activities in the in the current portfolio. Um, so we, mm, with that, um, perhaps. Uh, it would be useful to go a little bit more into the details of how the, this new activity will, will work. And I see there are some questions, uh, uh, one from Jose Moutinho, um, how does your initiative link up with ongoing in situ observations for the discovery of new cultural heritage sites? So this is about discovery, but also Again, as we mentioned earlier, the importance of in situ observations to complement satellite 
uh, observation and um, also uh, this question addresses the uh, new uh, technology uh, that will improve um, earth observations and there's a there's a specific um, uh, example for a threatened coastal area in Portugal. Uh, Evangelos, would you like to to reply to this one, perhaps? Uh, yes, I think it's not only uh, local uh, data and observations. I think it's the combination of satellite data and local information that can help in this uh, direction of discovering uh, new uh, cultural heritage uh, assets. Uh, there are many, many cases and projects in uh, the past uh, using even Google Earth that you can recognize uh, pa patterns uh, from, from the satellites and uh, then informing local uh, uh, resources and with the use of uh, drones uh, or local inspection, inspections uh, to be able to, you know, uh, design excavations and uh, discover actually new uh, monuments. So yeah, this is uh, really one of the opportunities that we have uh, combining the Earth observation. And may I point out here that when we say Earth observation, we mean both satellite data and in situ data. And this is also nowadays complemented with uh, citizen science data, with new uh, platforms like drones, like mass sensors. So Earth observation is really a very wide definition. Thank you, Evangelos, for this clarification. It's very important. Um, there are some questions uh, in the Q&A uh, box uh, that, I, that I'm trying to, to, to merge. Um, a lot of questions about the impacts on developing countries that are the heaviest, although most uh, World Heritage cities are probably located in Europe. Um, there's also a comment about the fact that uh, for developing countries, disaster risk is a, a, an important uh, element that needs to be taken into account for local adaptation. Um, so I guess uh, there is a, a reflection here to make, I guess also for Joanna, who works uh, mostly with developing countries. So the NAP program within the UNFCCC is to, there to support developing countries. And there is a specific um, financial mechanism that is uh, in place through the Green Climate Fund that will enable uh, the implementation of uh, national ad adaptation plans. So I wonder if um, Joanna has some uh, ideas about, about it and if she thinks that the symbolic and also the economic um, value of cultural heritage could be a push to achieve more uh, investments in climate action uh, for developing countries in the context of uh, national adaptation plans. Thanks, Sarah. I will do my best to respond to, to that quite uh, complicated, <laughs> complex, complex issue. Um, so I think uh, there's, there's a couple of points here. One is, of course, the value of Earth observations, the need for to use that information in the co-production of knowledge for, for um, planning and for um, implementation of adaptation action, the need to encompass a range of knowledge uh, that includes indigenous knowledge and that knowledge from local communities in that, in that response as well. And, and some of the work that we do under the UNFCCC actually uh, speaks specifically to the importance of indigenous knowledge and, and local communities in, in our response to climate change. Um, in regards to uh, the national adaptation process, there is funding available to, to prepare the national adaptation uh, plan. And then of course, those plans are, are, are developed and the projects within those plans are then um, you know, up to the countries to, to, to seek uh, funding for that. Now, funding under the Paris Agreement has, has been agreed as, as 20 billion per, per year to support, um, to support the, the implementation of the Paris Agreement for Mitigation and Adaptation, so that there is the potential for funding available. I saw a message earlier about why is it not, not happening. I mean, this is a, there's a big push, of course, to make sure that this, this funding that's been agreed by developed country parties actually is, is provided to, to implement what's been said in the NDCs and in the NAPs. So, and that the Glo and the Green Climate Fund is is one of the one of the key parts of the financial mechanism under the UNFCCC, and of course is responsible for agreeing those those 
adaptation plants once they're submitted through its through its process. So that that's uh, that that's really important. And then I think as as we go forward and, and the op opportunities to for countries, it's up to under our process up to the countries themselves to identify the importance um, that where they see um, their priorities. Uh, uh, and but as we've heard already today, you know, uh, with a, a large part of the population uh, and an increasing amount of population will reside in cities. So of course, the priorities in in that uh, country level decision making is is really focused in these areas. So I think there's there's still some uh, joining up of dots to be done. Let's put it that way in, 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 in awareness of, of some of these priorities. But I think there's a there's certainly an opportunity uh, under the multilateral processes. And the NAP actually brings in um, you know the needs under the Sendai framework, which speaks to, to risk resilience. It, it brings in the needs under the sustainable development uh, goals. So, so all of that comes together in the melting pot of the, of the national adaptation plan process. Um, and I, I, I think this this as, as I mentioned, most of the most of the parties that have provided national adaptation plans are recognizing this. Uh, the importance of cultural heritage. And then we come to the public awareness, of course, uh, and, and there's a lot of a push from, from that side to recognize um, this importance as well and engage with a wi wide community of stakeholders in order to, to make things happen. Um, and then within the process itself, of course, this recognition can be done in a, in a, with some of the uh, work of the GEO and actually showing the, the value of observations in, in its work and, and bringing this information back to the, to the process itself. Thank you, Joanna. Yes, it's, it's very important that the GEO is, is engaged uh, in the process uh, so we can provide this link to, to policymakers and, uh, and make sure that the, the outcomes of uh, all activities and, and this new uh, observatory will be taken up by by decision makers. Um, so again, as usual, I would add, if I may add one one sure. last thing, Sarah. Just I know we're running short of time, but I think there is a huge value in in showing case studies of of how you know this this value from observation to implementation and measuring it over time. And I think this is also a, a big role here in, in actually, um, and, and and we see that that's actually going to be the case in looking at what's actually worked as well as what hasn't worked and, and, and how things can move forward in the future. So sorry to interrupt, but I no, just sure, to sure. It's very important to point that out. And I see George has his hands up. George, yes. quickly, because we're running out of time. So I want to have a, I, a final, final I know. question. <laughs> Tara, I will make four points in a nutshell. It will be very quick. First of all, we want to expand the the spectrum of the UNESCO sites. And as our Portuguese uh, colleague has mentioned, if data are available on new sites, it is for the interested countries to propose them to the flexible mechanism to be mapped and digitalized. First point. Second point, in the adaptation and mitigation strategies, we need to promote a specific pillar which will address mitigation and adaptation in the urban environment in relation to cultural heritage and monuments of the nature. I think this needs to be highlighted with the view to having tailored uh, clusters within, within the strategies. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that we are very happy that the United States of America are coming back forcefully to the Paris Agreement with a very high level of ambition. And I am in the position to share with you that they have expressed a lot of sympathy for our initiative on assessing and uh, protecting uh, cultural and natural heritage from climate change impacts. And last but not least, for the European Union, as regards financing, almost 30% of uh, the budget under the recovery and resilience plan and the next programming period will go to climate. So this is extremely important, not only for the 27 member states of the EU, but also for the neighborhood policy and enlargement instruments. Thank you. I hope I was short. Yes, thank you, George. And uh, you touched upon uh, the, the last point that I wanted to 
to raise here, which is about um, priorities or key directions for this new urban heritage climate observatory. So I'm asking all of you, all of the speakers in one sentence or maybe one word towards what would be a valuable and tangible outcome for this new observatory. Um, starting with, let's say, um, Christina, towards. You're muted. Um, if I can, I would I would like to say concrete applications. Good. Easily usable by the user. Excellent. Shannon? Ditto. Interpreted information. Perfect. Um, Joanna? I actually echo very much what, what um, Christina and Shannon say. Um, the, the fact that we need to cross this, sorry, more than two words, but let's cross this knowledge uh, space between uh, science and, and decision making and get, provide usable information for, for that decision making. Thank you. Um, George, I've already asked you, but if you have two words, I, I share what uh, the previous speakers have said. I would say user-friendly and knowledge-based information. Excellent. Um, Gilberto, I see you're still there. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mertil Rosler as well. If I don't know if you have some final remarks to make in terms of what you see as a concrete outcome. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. I think it was a pleasure and an honor. Your, your volume is a bit low. Okay. Just. Uh, oh. This is. This is. Okay. Uh, should be better now. Yes. Sorry. Uh, this is hiccups of Zoom. So uh, it was an honor, it is, it is an, a great honor for the Geo Secretariat to host, uh, of course, the, uh, this uh, community activity. It is even much, much better to know that it's in very capable hands with, with strong science, with strong participation of partners like UNFCCC and UNESCO and, and, and the Covenant of Mayors. I think this is uh, really shows this uh, importance of GEO as a place that connects people and, uh, and, and that actually from the connection derives action. And in this case, uh, we are very uh, strongly believers that this action, the information will be given to mayors, to decision makers, to societies, informed, informed data, uh, science-based uh, policy is essential for the years to come. I think it's all has always been essential through humanity. In the years to come, we're going to need it more and more. So uh, my personal compliments to Evangelos because, uh, and to Joanna, thank you very much. To Christine on behalf of PISA, uh, UNESCO, thank you very much. Shannon, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my thanks to George. For representing you know a higher level of the Greek government. I think this has been a wonderful day for you. Thank you so much. It's been a great honor. Thank you, Gilberto. Dr. Grossler, any words from you or should we just uh, move to a close? Perhaps uh, I'll give back the floor to Evangelos and Jyoti for final remarks given we are um, three minutes over time. Sorry to all uh, the attendees who posted questions and we couldn't uh, reply during the live session, but we're still working on those and uh, the panelists can still answer in the, in the Q&A, so stay there. And uh, Evangelos and Jyoti will uh, explain what's gonna happen next. Thank you all and um, see you soon. Uh, thank you, Sara Jyoti, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. That was, and thank you to all of the speakers. It was really a very, very rich session, very, very important points raised. 
I just want to pick up on a couple of things that were picked that were brought up uh, as a way to close, which is that this is just the beginning. There were lots of questions on, you know, specific sites and uh, specific places. You know, how would we be able to collect that kind of local data? The World Heritage cities, 313 at the moment, um, are perhaps the most uh, recognizable cities. So in a sense, they're more symbolic there and they are the most, uh, the, they, there is more data for many of them. But um, that's not all the heritage there is in the world. Every small town, every small settlement has some historic places that are precious. So obviously that could be a very, very, you know, uh, uh, Shannon was talking about the emotional power of heritage. And this is very true. It's also, as Joanna was saying, a knowledge base because these places have come down to us over centuries in many cases. So they are repositories of knowledge on how they have dealt with and what resilience they, stories of resilience they bring to us. So this is just the beginning of a journey. And I, for all of those who are asking about specific sites, I just want to say that we start with World Heritage Sites just as a symbol. And we hope together with all of you to be able to look at this uh, for all types of historic places and uh, heritage cities and settlements. Thank you very much. And thank you very, very much for joining us today. Uh, I also thank uh, all participants for attending. Uh, we hope that many can come on board and embrace this in vivo. Uh, it has been a very interesting and fruitful meeting that hopefully uh, signals the beginning of a long, difficult yet pleasant journey, as Johnny, as Jyoti uh, said. And uh, tomorrow we are having our uh, community activity first convening. So this is gonna be a closed meeting between the partners, the 75 partners of the community activity. And we shall be talking about uh, more about the details and uh, the implementation aspects of, uh, uh, of the activity. Uh, so thanks everybody uh, for staying, uh, for being with us and stay tuned. And we will make sure that we communicate uh, all news and the outcomes uh, from uh, the uh, Urban Heritage Climate Observatory. Thank you all and bye bye. Thank you. I just want to take a second to thank the Greek Geo Office uh, for all of the work you've done in, in the heavy lifting and also to the Geo uh, colleagues and for the tech help and to the interpreters. Thank you very much. <laughs>